Hello, everybody. Hey, everyone. How are you guys this evening? I see that some of you guys are chiming in in the comments. Please say hi. Let Please us know hi. where you are watching from if you feel like it. Hi, Allison. Hi, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all here. We are so excited to to talk to you tonight because we we have things to we say. We have things to say. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us for this little talk about what dark academia is, why it's important, why we're doing something about it, and what it is, like, what the the genre slash aesthetic is all about. So I am thrilled to welcome you to our talk about this. And so, yeah, and the main purpose is just to basically answer what is dark academia, and there are several ways to answer this question. And we actually came at it from opposite directions ourselves when we started putting our big course on the subject together. So that is where we are going to start. So I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint real quick. Yes. Uh -huh. So dark academia. Magic. Secrets, Lies, and Libraries, which is a fantastic <laughs> name that Sarah came up with, and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I was very happy about it. Yeah, all right, let's do this thing. So as you might have realized, partially from what Brittany just said, and perhaps from an email that I sent out, I think yesterday, um, Brittany and I came at dark academia from incredibly different places <laughs> to the point where rare for us. I know this like never happens. Brittany and I are almost always kind of on the same page um, intellectually, creatively. It's very like zingy. We can like one of us can say like half of an idea and the other person will just kind of finish it. That is not what happened, my friends, <laughs> with dark academia. My friends. <laughs> um, we kept sort of talking past each other. We kept arguing about what counted as dark academia and what didn't. And like, I really can't convey to you how completely surreal that experience was because it just doesn't happen. But mercifully, fairly quickly, we figured out what was going on. And it was that we were coming at it from two fundamentally different directions, but both of which are really, really important and both of which we are going to delve into in much more depth in our full course um, dark Academia Foundations, and also more here tonight. So the way that I come at it is very much as a genre. I really didn't think about it very much as an aesthetic um, until Brittany was like, what are you talking about, Sarah? And kind of like, you know, broadened my mind and, and began to, to, think, um, to think about it through a different lens. But I think part of the reason that I really come at Dark Academia through a like genre perspective is because I really just don't do Instagram. I'm not as much of a visual thinker the way that Brittany is, like all the stuff that makes Carter Hall look so pretty. That is all Brittany. She is our, our visual storyteller. She's also an incredible writer, but definitely our visual storyteller. That is not me. I am not a visual storyteller. But I do read kind of constantly, which I really think more than anything is my coping mechanism for just being alive in the 2020s. I read a lot <laughs> to deal with it. So I'm it's jealous really, now. I, I, want, I want to be able to read as much as you do. <laughs> well, but you make things beautiful and that's very important too. <laughs> so <laughs> because of this, it's really not that surprising that on like kind of a gut level, on an intuitive and like, you know, just instinctive level, I initially think about dark academia as a particular style of story. And that's what I really mean when I'm using the word genre here. Genre can mean a bunch of different things. Tonight, the way we're using it is largely as like a style of story, a sort of um, type of story that has shared characteristics. Often when we talk about genres, we're saying like, you know, the fantasy genre or the detective genre or the horror genre, something like that. Dark academia can be considered a genre, if we're getting really picky, perhaps a subgenre under one of the other big umbrella um, places. So yeah, a certain style of story that has certain conventions. So when we come at it this way, when we come at dark academia from a genre place, there are a bunch of motifs that you see again and again. And when I say motif here, I mean, something like a pattern or a convention, some kind of repetition that just happens over and over from story to story. 
So the most common motif or most common convention really that we tend to see in dark academia is a school setting, which is why so very many dark Surprise. academia stories are set in a school. What was that, Brittany? Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. I know you're shocked. You know, something with the word academia and it has something to do with school. Shocking. However, and we got a great question about this a couple of days ago, this does not actually mean that all dark academia novels or stories or content in general is set in a school. It actually doesn't have to be set in a school. And Brittany and I had like this big debate about this um, a couple of days ago to like make sure we were on the same page, but we came to a place that we both feel pretty comfortable with and pretty confident defending, at least for now, maybe we'll change our minds later. But we do think that dark academia stories can also be set in places like museums or archives or other institutions or other situations that, uh, that explore concepts like intellectualism or learning, education in some capacity. Like there, there are other places that can contain that kind of story for sure. But schools are a really useful and also kind of comparatively relatable shorthand for saying, hey, in this story that I'm telling here, we're going to be thinking about intellectualism, learning, stuff like that. Um, school, the reason I say that the school is perhaps the most relatable possible dark academia setting is that, you know, maybe not as much people spend like an enormous amount of time in like archives, for instance. Brittany and I have actually spent a, a fair bit of time, but a not fair as bit much of time, time, <laughs> time there. Uh, and museums too, for that matter. But Archives even so, studies. yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so the school, but it can be more than the school. That is the motif that is the setting that tends to be the most common. But other common conventions that you'll see in dark academia stories can include lots of other things. In particular, you might see an outsider coming into an exclusive world and being completely dazzled up until the moment that the floor kind of falls out under them, the moment that like everything goes wrong because that's what happens in dark academia stories. Um, we usually see characters with access to incredible wealth and privilege. Those tend to be the kinds of characters that show up most frequently in dark academia. We will come back to that. Um, we also tend to see explicit exploration of the way that knowledge and intellectualism can enhance personal power. Um, another way of saying that is like how knowledge can get you ahead, how knowledge can be powerful. Um, it's a very, very common sort of theme or motif in dark academia. We also very frequently see the revelation of arcane secrets. And we also generally see <laughs> everything going to hell in a handbasket at some point in the story because someone has gone too far in their pursuit of power. And I would say above all, when we think about dark academia as a genre, something sinister is afoot. And I think that carries over to the aesthetic as well. But like there's always something kind of off or going wrong in dark academia stories. There's never there's never going to be like a chipper dark academia story, right? <laughs> like, or a sunny dark academia story. Like that's not, that's not the convention. That's not the genre. It's one that is sinister. It's one where things go wrong, which isn't to say that they have to end tragically. Some of them absolutely do, but they're definitely stories about things going wrong and backfiring in really dramatic ways. I should have said at the very beginning, um, if you have a question for us, please stick it um, in the Q&A box, which is off to the right of the chat. I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction, but you'll see it to the right of the chat. If you hover over it with your cursor, it will say Q&A. It looks like a little speech bubble with a question in it. Please put your questions there because we would love to answer them um, during the Q&A. We actually like love doing Q&A yeah, very love much. Q yeah, don't, so don't hesitate. Don't, yeah, <laughs> stick your questions there and we will come back to them. If they're in the chat, we very we'll, well might miss them because it moves fast and we are looking at notes on another screen. So we're just not going to see all of it. Okay. Tell us where you're coming from, Brittany. So when I first, we first started talking about doing a course about dark academia, I was like, 
I was coming at the idea of dark academia from an almost entirely aesthetic place, meaning that I was more concerned about how the story looked and felt as opposed to all the bright pieces like plots or motifs like Sarah was talking about being in place. So that means that I too thought it had a lot to do with schools and, as, and other like institutions of higher learning like museums and um, archives and, and things like that. But that, for example, a school like the School of Maths in A Deadly Education by uh, Naomi Nowak um, didn't really feel like dark academia to me. And I said this to Sarah and she was like, excuse me, because I oh, know. Oh, I was the right. Like, that pieces were there, right? Like, Brittany, what are you talking about? Like, this is the most dark academia novel ever. And she was like, it's not, though. And we were like, we're going to have to sit down. We're going to have to sit down and talk about this because we're we were have really have like at a strange place here. Yeah. So for me, yes, the story was about a school where deadly things happen. There's all kinds of esoteric knowledge throughout. There's a even this like sort of poor outsider versus rich insider storyline happening. But to me, the story wasn't feeling like dark academia because the school itself was so grimy. Wasn't it was decadent enough for It Brittany. was <laughs> dirty. It was rough. It was broken. And I just kept feeling like, okay, so, but where are the marble columns, the velvet pillows? Where are the heated discussions about art and passion taking place in, you know, these visually perfect libraries or perfect little coffee shops? you know, while terrible secrets play out in, you know, people's furtive glances and like in the background, but the the vibe of the school was not fitting uh, dark academia as an aesthetic to me. So coming at dark academia from an aesthetic perspective means that you really do get away with including stories that aren't especially academia oriented but still very much in that whole columns, velvet libraries kind of vibe. I'm thinking in particular of things like Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is almost always listed on dark academia book lists and does not feature a school or a library or anything like that, like as a very standard set piece in the book. It has the right look, it has the right feel, but unless you count Lord Henry's sort of school of life philosophy as being some sort of academic aspect of this book, it doesn't really have the right kind of uh, feel. And I think what it boils down to is that when you're approaching dark academia from an aesthetic point of view, you're approaching it from the vibes perspective. You're approaching it from a visual perspective. The idea that there are ways that stories look and feel that make things seem like dark academia to you. So in a way, it connects with some, things, with some of the things that we've said in the past about the Gothic, that kind of, you know it when you see it kind of thing. And <clears throat> um, it, makes it, uh, it makes it harder to sort of say like what makes something academia, dark academia, because it boils down to this you, what do you feel makes something academia? What you, what what do you feel makes something, you know, what vibes are the right thing, vibes for you? And so ultimately, once Sarah and I realized that we were coming at it from these two different perspectives, we thought it was important to include in the course, and when we're thinking about dark academia generally, this idea of dark academia sort of being both of these things, which is why dark academia can also be considered... <laughs> it can also be considered a subculture. And we're not going to get into this too much today, particularly because it's not where either Brittany nor I were when we were putting the class together. But we did want to take a minute to acknowledge that dark academia is also sometimes described as a subculture. Um, often this might be through online communities, um, particularly Tumblr and Instagram, like hypervisual mediums. Mm -hmm. Um, so this means essentially that in order to be part of the subculture, you need to perhaps like dress a certain way, you read certain things, you're interested in certain topics. So you can imagine, I think fairly easily, how everything we've been talking about can lend itself to a subculture that determines how people dress, present themselves, and act in day-to-day -day life. So 
We're not going to spend too much time on that here today, but it is another way you could get at dark academia by genre, by aesthetic, or by subculture. There are probably other fruitful avenues that you could take as well, but those are the three that we think are the most interesting, and they're the three that we see kind of crop up the most when we see people talking about dark academia. So what is it then? Again, <laughs> dark academia is just made up of all of these things. And we're going to unpack it a lot more during the course, but we wanted to put that forward as part of this talk because we really feel like dark academia is made up of all of these things and that they're all working together to produce this sort of cultural moment of dark academia that we see so in so many books and films coming on right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I just have to say, I caught it zooming by in the chat. Jade says Wednesday with uh, Jenna Ortega definitely gives me dark academia vibes. Did you know we're actually watching an episode <laughs> of Wednesday as part of our Dark Academia Foundations uh, course? Because yeah. we're watching Wednesday. Like, Yeah, we're happening. watching Wednesday. So, We've got to talk about it. People love it. They hate it. It doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it because it is, yeah. it is fascinating. And it has so much to do with dark academia, both in terms of a genre and an aesthetic. Like that yeah. show has an aesthetic. So if you're a fan of Wednesday, definitely consider getting in there in the course. Mm -hmm. So why does any of this matter? Why does dark academia even matter? Well, one of the most interesting things about dark academia, to me and Brittany at least, is that it is a very conscious exploration of power and that's interesting so <laughs> of course always interesting yeah it's, it's always interesting and any genre can be used to think through power and power differentials um, fairy tales which we talk about all the time here at carter ha do it all the time very frequently fairy tales or explorations of power but it's just so overt in dark academia and we think that's because power is literally the point of many dark academia stories. Like, it's not subtext a lot of the time. It's just text. It is, these are stories where people are consciously trying to amass more power, wrest it from other people, critique the way that power is being distributed. And like, this is a great mode of storytelling for illuminating cultural assumptions about who has power, who actually deserves power, and why. And I feel like, you know, Brittany and I, uh, our, our argument for existing at this point seems to be <laughs> that things that appear to be frivolous, things that fly under the radar because they're often deemed to be culturally insignificant, things like fairy tales, things like dark academia, like there's this very strong cultural cultural perception that they don't matter, that these things are frivolous and silly. But so often those things have so much power in of themselves and they dictate to us like what we think about power without ever even consciously thinking about it. A lot of the time as consumers of these stories, we just kind of take them in. And because we're often taught like, well, these don't really matter. They're silly. They're frivolous a lot of the time. You know, they're, for, they're considered to be for women and therefore not as significant or important. Um, but that kind of only enhances like what they can do because they're not being looked at too directly. They kind of sneak up on you with all of this like rich cultural meaning, all of this cultural baggage. And it's our favorite thing in the world to take something that other people think is frivolous and be like, let's break this down. Let's talk about why this is actually insanely important. And because dark academia is literally just people wrestling with power, we want to talk about it. So we also think that dark academia could be an incredibly useful category for challenging kind of assumptions about the status quo and even imagining possible worlds. And we're paraphrasing a little bit our friend Derek Newman still there who writes about the power of speculative fiction as a way to imagine the world that you want to see. Um, it can also, dark academia can also be used very directly to critique existing systems of power. And dark academia overall really could just be a part of that imaginative project of thinking about how power could be distributed, about 
you know, challenging our assumptions about who deserves to have it. And we think that that matters a lot. Okay. Now, some of you may be thinking, <laughs> <laughs> okay, aren't you guys a folklore school? Or at least like folklore and the Fantastics? Some of the books you guys are talking about in this course are not magical at all, just so you know. And we do know that, and that is true. So <clears throat> there are actually a few reasons why Dark Academia is still very squarely in our wheelhouse in particular. But the biggest thing is that Dark Academia actually really is rooted in portrayals of folklore. And one of the things we wanna talk about in the, this foundations course is why that is and what folklore can bring to this conversation about Dark Academia. So a few of the folklore things about Dark Academia that we wanna talk about are things like the fact that dark academia is often centered around small groups that share common interests, struggle with power structures, and then get way too close to each other. This is actually the prime setting for where folklore happens. Folklore is artistic communication in small groups. It is about how people form these close-knit things, these close-knit close -knit communities. Communities, yeah, things. Communities. <laughs> and how they negotiate power structures within those communities, how they share secrets, how they interact with each other. All of that is at the center of almost every Dark Academia novel. So in a way, you could argue that these groups of people who star in Dark Academia stories are in shared folk groups and that the thing that turns them into a folk group most often, you know, they have these shared interests and things like that, but it's usually a shared secret or a shared mm -hmm. pursuit of the occult or a certain school of intellectualism that they really bond over. And that's really interesting from a folkloristic perspective. Other things that come up, of course, are things like secrets and subversion, which we will get to in more, more in a moment. And then, of course, this esoteric knowledge that is almost always the focus of dark academia books. Sometimes you get like overt esoteric knowledge, like uh, like um, magic sort of stories, like um, a deadly education, for example, or his dark materials, or even Harry Potter. There's this um, this idea that these these books are sort of centered around magical kinds of things and uncovering magical secrets. At the same time, even in more realistic texts, you get an obsession often with things that border on esoteric knowledge, things like the tarot, things like medieval history, an obsession with classics and mythology. That one comes up a lot. If you're familiar with one of the key um, dark academia texts, The Secret History, that is all about classics and mythology, which means that there is a thread of folklore running through that book that needs to be pulled. And we want to pull, be the ones who pull that thread. <laughs> <clears throat> so a couple of other reasons why we are really good at people to do a dark academia course is that we are really, really familiar with this world. This is sort of where we uh, cut our teeth and grew up uh, in this world of dark academia, if you've been reading our emails, you know that we are very much, uh, you know, have been sort of submerged in this world and are now a little bit further away from it and can realize that there is a lot to critique here and a lot to discuss. Also, you ha we have to note that you may have noticed that the course is called Dark Academia Colon Foundations. And that this is definitely meant to be a foundational course, which means that, you know, we're not going to talk about as many of the magical aspects of it, but this is the course that will set up what Dark Academia is, what makes it tick, and doing this first allows us to maybe do a course later called something like Dark Academia, the Magic School, or something like that. So Maybe, maybe. We'll see how maybe, it goes. But we'll see how this one goes. But that. Yes. We would love to do something like that. So, But first, we need this kind of foundational course so that everybody's on the same page, so that we can talk about all this, this stuff that is entrenched in the world of dark academia and there are some major issues in there which is what we're going to talk about next yeah this um this course is very much thinking about like how this genre or aesthetic 
was pieced <laughs> together, where its roots are, where it comes from, and therefore kind of some of the assumptions that underpin dark academia as a whole, which is actually a great transition to talking about some of the major issues with dark academia. Of and which there, there been, are many. <laughs> of which there are many. There have been a lot of criticisms aimed at dark academia, um, criticisms that we, I mean, agree with and that we're yeah. very much keeping in mind as we put this course together and hope to address directly throughout. And also to think about the dark academia stuff that is like already addressing this very, very head on because there's some amazing stuff out there already. So to begin with, dark academia as it's sort of commonly perceived, certainly generally as it appears as an aesthetic on Instagram, is very much underpinned by colonialist power structures. Another way of saying that, a more simplified way of saying that, is that dark academia is often just incredibly white. Um, it tends to feature like often like all white protagonists or students at an institution, sometimes like only white male students who were even allowed to be admitted at a given institution. And that's sort of taken as, like taken for granted, often in a way that is considered, well, that's just normal. That's just how things were. And this is sort of complicated by the introduction of nostalgia that kind of gives this remembered slash, you know, imagined world a kind of glow that's really kind of icky if we think about it. A romanticization, so, though. Exactly. A lot of this has to do with a romanticization of the past while ignoring the inequalities and the systems of power that allow the institutions and ideals of dark academia to exist at all. And this is actually really ironic, considering that dark academia is, as we've been saying over and over in this talk, a genre that's all about power. Like, shouldn't it be a genre that's about critiquing all systems of power and not necessarily like personal struggles for power between like a bunch of like equally rich white students, but like in a lot of foundational texts and a lot of texts that continue um, through the present and in a lot of Instagram feeds, that's still mostly what you see. Um, but not every dark academia text, especially um, older ones, they don't really go too deep under the surface in all of this, thinking about like the construction of power on like such a deep level. They just kind of take these assumptions about how the world should be, how the world was, and kind of let that sit there without poking at it. Um, they might examine the power struggle between like a bunch of white men of a certain class, but not really treat women or people of color as like subjective characters or players in the world. They're just, they might not even be present or they might be you know present as kind of like side characters. So that is problem number one that is huge. But again, there are texts that are very much pushing back on this, and we'll talk about some of those too. Another issue is a certain kind of romanticization of higher education. And this one is, honestly, this is why it's taken Brittany and I this long to do a course on dark academia, because we've wanted to forever, but we come from the world of higher education. Like we got PhDs in English and folklore. You know, we've been deeply, deeply entrenched in that world. And while you're in that world, it you just kind of get subsumed by the culture in a lot of different ways. And I think we've needed some distance to be able to talk about this in the way that we want to talk about it, to feel sort of like confident and grounded and kind of, you know, doing our own thing in our own way um, before we were ready to poke at this too much. So when I say the romanticism, romanticization of higher education, um, I'm thinking especially about like super elite universities as well as past versions of universities, i.e. like, you know, the Ivy Leagues schools, but like before they admitted like women or people of color, which like is not that far in the past, which just, ah, like it's, it's way more recent than, than is bearable. Um, so a lot of dark academia stuff really kind of romanticizes versions of these schools when they were much more exclusive, when only a very, very narrow segment of the population was permitted to be in it at all. Um, it's also kind of tied up with like a glorification of wealth that we see 
very much still alive in the aesthetic, the way that stuff looks on Instagram, on Dark Academia Instagram. Um, this idea that like looking at all of this luxury without thinking about how that luxury got there, like the cost of the luxury, if that makes sense. Um, and the last thing I want to bring up right now is the idea of nostalgia as denial, which ties into a bunch of the stuff I've already been saying. So the idea that, you know, things were so much more elegant. Um, we had, we had so much more like power back in the good old days but without really thinking about what that former status quo, like what allowed that former status quo to exist. So a lot of dark academia kind of rests on top of this really rotten foundation without looking at it, which again is so ironic because it is a genre that's all about power, but sometimes they don't really look at where that power that they're fighting over really even came from. So those are some of the main critiques that are leveraged against dark academia, and they're things that we will be coming back to again and again throughout the course and unpacking in different ways. And I just saw someone type his dark materials in all caps. It's Allison. Yes, his dark materials were like the most formative thing ever <laughs> for me. <clears throat> so all of the things that Sarah just mentioned are incredibly important. And in any discussion of dark academia, definitely need to be brought up. But we don't want to ignore the fact, and we're definitely going to talk about the fact that there are some texts out there now that are fantastic subversions of all of those things. This is definitely a more recent development, um, even as the fact that that dark academia as a genre as something you could like pick out or aesthetic um, is just being developed now. There are books that are pushing back against it too. We're specifically talking about texts like Babel by R.F. Kuang in particular. Um, it centers a Chinese protagonist and really explodes this uh, the colonialist mindset behind a lot of higher education and institutions of learning writ large. And so that kind of thing we're going to talk about as well, because that exists too and is part of the world of dark academia. Yeah, I would also very much include Naomi Novik's um, Skolomance books in doing sure. that kind of project and that kind of work as well. And like that is definitely another book that is a very explicit exploration of power but like on this grand scale that Brittany and I are talking about and that we really want dark academia to be, we want it to delve into these really, really deep more issues. More and more, yeah. Yeah, instead of like superficial power squabbles, we want them to go deep. We want them to go into their foundations and really question everything about why the world is the way it is, why we have these assumptions, why we have, why these prejudices um, are there and how they kind of prop up a lot of pre-existing dark academia. Sorry, I almost sneezed. Oh no, um, I was but like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I almost sneezed. Apologies. No. The thing is though, those subversions are starting to exist and people are doing more and more projects with that kind of thing now than ever before. And that's really exciting too. Yeah. Okay, so we want to give you some key examples. We've been seeing lots of names zoom by in the chat. <laughs> if there is a particular text you want us to weigh in on, please do stick it in the actual like ask a question box and we'll get to it in the Q&A. We're just, we can't catch everything in, in the chat, but we wanted to give you a couple of names so that you know, you know what we're thinking about. So if we're talking about key examples of sort of proto dark academia, so a lot of the stuff that we're doing in Dark Academia Foundations, stuff that existed before this genre or aesthetic really coalesced into what it is today, the stuff that led up to it. We can think about books like Dangerous Liaisons. We can think about The Picture of Dorian Gray. We can think about Maurice by E.M. Forster. Um, our friend Juliet Norillier actually asked us the other day if Dorothy L. Sayer's book, Gaudy Night, Gaudy Night would be a precursor to dark academia. And we think like, absolutely. I was so glad that she brought that up because Gaudy Night um, is a book that I've just adored for over a decade. And when I see people talk about it, which is not of often enough at all, um, it usually comes up in the context of being the first feminist detective novel. 
which is already really flipping Already cool. super, yay. Yeah. Already <laughs> so cool. But we also think it probably had a considerable role in the sort of the, the roots of dark academia. So that's pretty cool. Um, a really important key text that we are going to be reading in this course is The Secret History. And it's usually considered to be like the establishing text of the genre. Um, it's one that people usually point to when they're like this, this is the first dark academia book. So we're, we have to read that one. Got to talk about that one. Um, Brittany actually just reread it very recently. I'm still due for my reread, but she had a great time. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to say it's a good book. It's really well done. And I think that there's a lot to talk about there. You know, the characters are, they're definitely like very problematic characters, right? But the the story itself, just the way it's put together, it has, I mean, you can trace how much it's influenced the genre slash aesthetic from there so much. And I, I cannot wait to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I want to just add a couple of my personal favorite dark academia books that I've read, you know recently and long ago, just the ones that I'm like, oh my God, these are amazing, are His Dark Materials, um, which I already mentioned because I saw it fly by in the chat and was like, I have, I have to acknowledge that someone else said something. Um, reading His Dark Materials as a little kid um, is actually the reason that I ended up going to study at Oxford in college, which is ridiculous because my experience at Oxford did not have anything to do with the no. portray and it's for the best. <laughs> I guess. Really, I didn't need to be like kidnapped um, and tortured. So it, it's probably for the best, but like that's how. I want a Damon though. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Um, but it, it was a really, really key, like formative text for me just as a person when I was growing up. So, and that is like very dark academia. Other favorites that are much more recent are, of course, A Deadly Education, which I've already talked about several times, and also Kwong's Babel, which I have seen come up in the text, uh, the chat several times as well, and is absolutely dark academia. Like, out of those three that I just mentioned, like, that is maybe the most dark academia, most concentrated dark academia um, out of all of them, and is really deeply engaged with thinking about power on a foundational level, thinking about it in terms of like empire and colonialism and race and gender. And like, I'm not going to lie to you. It is a difficult book to read, like just because it's like horrible things happen, but, um, but it's a really, really powerful, really incredible um, and bold book. So if you if any of that sounds good, I, I cannot recommend that particular book highly enough. Uh, we're not reading it in the course because it's, you know, much newer and we're looking at the foundations here. But if we do um, another iteration of of this course in more contemporary dark academia, like that one will be showing up for sure. <laughs> okay, so... Anyway, you slice it. <laughs> there is no denying that dark academia, just taken as a whole, is a really new genre. It's a really new, uh, like, coalesced into a particular kind of aesthetic, even if the roots of it are really old. But it's actually really cool to think of it that way because it means that the question of what is dark academia is still being answered. And key and, you know, perhaps even foundational texts like maybe Babel, for, actually for sure Babel, mm -hmm. these texts are still being written right now. It is a genre still in its infancy. And that makes it really exciting. So time will tell whether Dark Academia is going to stick around like long term or at least under that name. I mean, we've been obsessed with stories about school for a really, really long time. But this seems like its own particular thing. And right now, it's still being constructed. We're still determining exactly what it is and what it can and should do. And that makes it super exciting. And that is why we cannot wait to talk about it. Yeah. So, so we have actually a question for you guys just to mull over. Where do you want to see dark academia go next? Like, what sort of story, what sort of topics would you just absolutely love to see a dark academia story tackle. And we'll keep an eye on the chat uh, because we're generally curious 
to know what you'd like to see more of in this genre in the future. You know, we can't unfortunately personally provide that, <laughs> but, you know, we, we can keep out an eye for those kinds of stories and let you guys know if we happen to see them. I know. I so. want, so there are so many things I want. <laughs> I know. Like one thing we really want to see are more dark academia books that deliberately engage with non-white cultures. That's like the top of our list. Babel does that beautifully, but we, we need a whole lot more. We need so. a whole lot more. And I think yeah. there's so much potential there. I just I'm like, come on. I know they're, <laughs> I know people come are writing on. them. Yes, for sure. And we want to see more deliberately like magic folklore centered texts. So what we really, really want, if we're going to be honest with you, is a dark academia book with a folklorist protagonist, like right now, yes, we want please. one of those. We would yeah. like one of those. And there's so yes. much potential there, right? Like, I know. Um, <laughs> like so much potential for them to get it like so wrong, but also potential for them to get it right. So you never know. <laughs> Someday. Erin says, please write that. <laughs> honestly, we honestly have an idea for something like that. We do. That we really, really like, but like, I don't know when we would have the time to write a novel. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll someday. It's really cool, someday. though. <laughs> it's really fucking cool. It's such a good idea. We have maybe like someday. The, we have this whole like, um, I magic know, system just, yeah we have this whole set magic system but i was just thinking about how we were just like we were trying to go to bed and we were like but what if this happened and then and then what if this out happened and be like but what about this and we'd be like oh my god that's amazing i know and like you know my husband was like trying to go to bed and Brittany and i were just in the hallway like screaming and he was like are you guys okay and we were like What's no <laughs> we're like no we have thought of amazing thing yeah so, so someday. someday um so we're <laughs> We're going to move to the Q&A. We see that we have a whole bunch of questions over there. We will answer as many as we possibly can. And we also have some that were sent in um, in advance. But we just want to take at least a second to say, if you enjoyed all of this, if these books and these stories and these ideas sound cool to you, we really, really, really hope that you'll join us for Dark Academia Foundations. This is a very different course than really anything we've ever done before. Um, I also want to add, we're thinking about uh, creating a like audio only like podcast version of this course, um, like to go so alongside all the regular stuff. Yeah, to, like, yeah so if you're hesitant video. about video, I think that this could be something really cool. So we're definitely looking into that. I also yeah. want to add that, um, so we're, we're reading these these key foundational books, but we're also going to have slumber parties, and <laughs> that's really awesome. <laughs> yeah. So um, um, we're going to watch also, the Dark Academia as well. Yes. So we're giving you guys two weeks to read each of the books because some of them are quite a bit longer. So we want to give you lots of time to read without feeling super rushed. That's why we have the two weeks between the main lectures They're and then books. movie nights <laughs> every other week where we just kind of like gather in our pajamas <laughs> for a, uh, a group chat um, while we are watching the movies. So if you have any questions about the course, we'd also be very, very um, really happy, happy to, answer, to <laughs> answer any questions about that. Um, seriously, this is going to be flipping awesome. If you enjoyed this, I really, really hope you'll consider joining us for the course. I'm seeing people say yes on the podcast. I'll also add that we found a way to get subtitles onto our lectures too. And I know mm -hmm. that that has been something that a lot of people have wanted for a long time and that we finally have like the technology and the systems, um, the, the tech stuff that we use to make that happen. So subtitles. And we're strongly Working on considering podcasts. having a podcast version to go with the regular lecture, lectures for those of you who, you know, like to listen while you drive, listen while you do chores. That's definitely me. I listen to like all my podcast content doing that. So yes, the subtitles. So all, all good things. Um, all right, let's get to the Q&A, Brittany. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> all right. Um, we have a couple. Yeah, a couple okay. that people submitted early too. So yes. So the first one, which we promised to answer today, was what does dangerous liaisons have to do with dark <laughs> academia? Which is fair. And that is, you know, it's a book that is over 200 years old. Um, it's the first book that we are having you guys read for Dark Academia Foundations. 
Um, we are only asking people to read the first third of it, um, like volume one or book one. I forget what it's called. It's called book, um, book one because it's real long. You can read the whole thing, though, if, if you are moved to. We certainly will be. Um, but yeah, Brittany, this was your idea. Why don't you explain <laughs> yourself? <laughs> explain myself. Okay. So when we first were talking about how we wanted to do a dark academia course, this was like at the like in January, I think we were talking about, we were like, okay, I think we're ready. We really want to do something yeah. like this. And we were trying to figure out like how we wanted to approach it. And one of the things that we were talking about is that we were fascinated by this idea of rich people, aristocrats, royalty, et cetera, behaving badly. And how central that seemed to dark academia as a whole, how there was almost always this like outsider character coming in to like experience this world of incredible decadence, of incredible um, wealth, of, of very like high intellectual conversations. And what kind of, um, what kind of like, where did, how did we get to that point? It's connected to celebrity culture. It's connected to influencers. It's connected to our obsession with royalty and why we're always like, why there are so many magazines on the at the checkout stand in the supermarket about like what Will and Kate are doing at you know as like prince and princess of of Wales in England, and <clears throat> and we're like, why do we care about that stuff? Why does that matter? Why do so many of those magazines feature like bad things happening to these people and everybody's like just eating them up? What is that about? And so we thought about, you know, where did this obsession start? And, you know, we could make an argument that this obsession goes all the way back to fairy tales, right? Stories about bad things happening to like princes and princesses <laughs> and, you know, princesses being locked in towers or cursed or whatever. But there there's probably, you know, it probably goes back a little bit to things like the French Revolution, stuff like that. And maybe a little bit further than that, when people were watching things like what inspired the French Revolution of aristocrats being so different from common people, so different from the world that most people were experiencing. And being Just extreme really, inequality, essentially. Yeah, ex yeah, extreme inequality. And being fascinated with what they were doing over there. Like, what was going on over there? And a sort of perverse pleasure in seeing their downfall, in seeing something bad happen to them. And when we were talking about all of this, we realized that Dangerous Liaisons is a book about aristocrats behaving badly, a book where we can watch the sort of downfall of an aristocrat who is not a very good person, not a good person at all, yeah. and, <laughs> and watch his, like, you know, watch their whole world come apart in a way that really seems to inspire dark academia later. And so that's why we're reading Dangerous Liaisons as one of the key texts for Dark Academia Foundations, because we really feel like this is one of the early texts that's that it gets focuses that vibe. on vibe. Yeah, it yeah. gets that vibe that focuses on that kind of thing. And that plot, that plots of like these super privileged people who were so separate from how the rest of the world lives. Like, yeah. look at them. They're behaving terribly. terribly. Like, let's watch them, you know, make a mistake. Let's watch them and implode. Watch them fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that is very much a thread that continues to run through a lot of dark academia stuff now. Yeah, it really does. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about this obviously much more in the course. Yeah. But I think that, that that gives you an idea of why we're so like dangerous liaisons. This is really crucial. Important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we'll say much, much more about that in the course, but that is our explanation for why it's even there. Um, someone else asked, uh, early, how much are we going to talk about the bad sides of all of this, about the, the dark side of dark academia, <laughs> a sentence, um, a fair bit. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about all kinds of different parts of dark academia. Um, a lot of it is going to be driven by like discussion, by talking to you guys live during the lectures, but we are absolutely going to think about power differentials um, 
like it's a very key part of our uh, our approach to dark academia and what those different power differentials are, um, what the assumptions are, and how they allow these stories and this genre to be constructed. I think we answered the other one that's on here. It, um, but we can address it more closely. Um, one of the mm -hmm. questions we got on Facebook was. Dark academia has been categorized as a defined subgenre pretty recently, like in the past, past few years. How do you draw the line between novels that fall under this category and those that don't? Are all books set in schools dark academia, like do the Harry Potter books fall into this category too? And can a book be dark academia if it's not set in a school? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we at least started to answer that. Um, a book can absolutely be dark academia if it's not set in a school. Um, but no, not all books set in schools are dark academia, for sure. Like, their school stories have been around for a really long time. Um, there are lots of chipper school stories, for yeah. instance, or, like, even, sweet school stories. Yeah. There are, yeah, there are lots of sweet ones. There are lots of ones that even have, like, problems and stuff that come up. Um, I'm thinking about, like, all Colette's school stories that mm -hmm. are... You know, there are lots of issues that come up in those stories, but they're not, they don't have the right vibe, <laughs> yeah. which is what I keep coming back to. But they also don't have the right plots, the right kind of um, motifs or anything like that, too. Yeah, I've seen Carol mention Bride's Head Revisited in the chat a couple of times. and like, oh, yeah, like that is definitely oh, yeah. another proto dark. We considered talking about that one as a foundational text for sure. Yeah, we thought about using that one and ended up going with Maurice instead, mm -hmm. um, largely because Maurice isn't read as much. And also because Maurice is like, surprisingly subversive. And we I'm really pretty, wanted to talk about cool. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, like, kind of cool, like, go all the way to the end before before you uh, um try to agree or disagree with that particular statement because there's definitely plenty leading up to it that's like oh god no but the end like he sticks the landing like yeah. especially for the period in a way that I was like oh my god I can't <laughs> believe Ian Forster you know wrote the first draft of this in like 1913 or something mm -hmm. very cool um as for how we draw the line between novels which fall under this category yeah I think we've talked about that a lot um mm -hmm over the course of the evening. Um, obviously, <laughs> Brittany and I, Brittany, don't die. Um, Brittany and I are not like the final arbiters of like what like counts in the world as dark academia or not. Like we definitely have our opinions about it. But like clearly, sometimes we've disagreed with each other. Um, but we've identified a lot of the plot points that we think are really key for a dark academia story. We've talked a lot about of the... Um, the elements for the aesthetic, like once you get enough of them, I feel like it's probably safe to say that it's dark academia, but it's always going to be a bit objective, but then, uh, I mean, a bit subjective, but then some stuff is just going to be like so highly concentrated dark academia that you can't even argue about it. You know, something right. like Babel, you look at it and you're like, well, that's dark yep. academia. <laughs> Or something like the Scholomance books where Brittany and I can look at it and I'll be like, well, yeah. And Brittany will be like, well, no. So Exactly. And that yeah. that maybe, yeah, those are just, there are always going to be differing opinions about stuff like that. So where the line is, what the line looks like. Yeah. Um, as far as, you know, can a book be dark academia if it's not set in a school? I think that we argue, yeah, but there yeah. has to be some level of intellectual pursuit. pursuit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Okay. And our last pre submitted question was from Annalise on Facebook. And she says, What are the best places you have found for dark academia, clothes, etc.? Um, I this love links that question. To this, this links to the subgenre, right? I know. It links to the subgenre. Sub yeah. And the aesthetic for that matter. Yeah. Um, honestly, everywhere, um, there are some, you know, particular brands that Brittany and I both really like in particular like blood milk jewelry we both really like I'm wearing their like murder dagger earrings today if you can see them in my hair which right. eats everything so you know swords you know I feel like that's dark academia and the right concentration um we also both honestly do a lot of thrifting mm -hmm. um buying secondhand stuff we oh god Columbus Ohio had the best thrift stores. I don't know what that was about. Oh, they really did. And I'm very sad. <laughs> I know. Yeah. How about you, Brittany? What are some other ones that you go to that are very dark academia? I mean, I think that they're, so I'm thinking of a lot of jewelry places. Like I think Paris mm -hmm. Relics can be um, 
uh, Dark Academia, I think mm -hmm. um, Regal Rose, which is a UK store, um, often has a lot of stuff that can qualify. I love, um, I love just looking for this stuff. So like, if you look on, you know, places like, I feel like more, more of our places are like, look at our Dark Academia collection or something like that. But <laughs> um, I love looking on like Instagram and TikTok at people who are trying to cultivate that kind of aesthetic and looking at where they find their clothes. So that's a good yeah. place to start. Those are a few, a few of the different places that we think of. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Oh my goodness, there are so many in the Q&A. Let's see what we can do. Woo! Okay. All right, I think this first one, actually, we may have answered already. Um, this is from Judith, and she says, what is the difference between a dark academia book such as The Secret History and books with school settings such as Naomi Novik's Skullamance trilogy? Is there a difference? I can see where Harry Potter books might be considered more of a fantasy series versus dark academia, but an argument could be made for Dark Academia. Novik's series is closer to the Harry Potter books in some ways versus the secret history, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on differences between the genres, if you think there are any differences. Also, Lee Bardugo's Ninth House. Oh my God, yes. I think that fits Dark Academia. Oh yeah. Lines seem to overlap and blur at times between genres and aesthetics. Yes. Um, Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Ninth I wish House. I could say that it was like clear cut all the time, but it just mm -hmm. isn't. It isn't. Yeah. But I mean, I would say, interesting. <laughs> yeah, Ninth House, I think it is pretty clear cut. Like that just is Dark Academia. Like yeah. the concentration is high there. Yes. The concentration is high. If we did a like magic school book, that would definitely that would be, be one there. that would be fun to talk about. <laughs> For sure. Um, Harry Potter, I personally would not be inclined to classify them as dark academia, largely because I don't think the series as a whole feels like it is. I'd say the later books kind of tip more tip in that, that direction. Way. But like the first book, I don't feel like it really is. It, doesn't, it just doesn't feel sinister enough to me. Yeah, it's a school story for sure. Yeah, I do, yeah. I think that it, it goes more that way. I think that Harry Potter often pops up on Dark Academia lists because mm -hmm. there is a tendency to go more that way later. But I would, I would think, I think of it more as a fantasy series. And we already talked about the School of Man's trilogy. <laughs> Yes, which I am very much like, yes, it's totally <clears throat> dark academia. And Brittany, I don't know if you uh, have changed your mind at all, if you're just like, it doesn't feel right. It Not doesn't enough feel right. right. Yeah, it like still doesn't feel right to me. It's so gritty. It's so, mm -hmm. like, um, there's so much, it's like all about battling, which doesn't feel dark academia to me. Dark academia feels like secrets and... Um, but they have Other secrets scene, in like, the Scholomance books. Like, I know, <laughs> but it's not the same. It's just not the same to me. I, so I you guys, really, now you're getting a, a sneak peek into what happens when we try to put this course together. I'm willing, I'm willing to consider it like as as part of like a genre that would include other dark academia books. And I but like vibe wise, I'm just not feeling it. I don't I mean, know vibe, why. Vibe wise, I agree with you, but again, like since that's just not where my brain not where your brain is yeah <laughs> is. i'm like fine. and i understand that a, and i accept it as yeah. a genre dark academia genre book. <laughs> there you go so it's just not always clear cut we wish it was we wish we had a handy dandy like checklist that would work every single time but like it's just always going to be a little bit subjective for some of these more in the middle okay thank you judith um which lit would like to know, are there any contemporary memoirs involving dark academia? Um, Brittany actually did some research earlier and pulled some that might fit. Yeah, so um, there's a book called Privilege that's about um, unpacking a experience at Harvard that seems like it probably is very similar. There's another one called, um, that's, I, the name is escaping me right now. Lost um, in Meritocracy. Yes, that's it. Which is um, a book that is about a guy who goes to Princeton and finds that the world there is not at all what he was expecting and is more of the dark academia sort of style. Yeah. So I anticipate because the genre as fiction is becoming more and more popular that we will see more memoirs come that are part of the genre aesthetic um as time goes on but those are the the two we were able to find uh before we came on here 
Yeah. So we haven't read them ourselves. We can't yeah. really vouch for them. I don't know for that, sure. Yeah. There are two that popped up that seemed potentially dark academia-ish to us. So there, there are some out there that at least seem like they might be adjacent. All right. So what else have we got? Jamie says, how does supernatural and gothic elements overlap with dark academia? It seems that they are not required elements, but they are often present. So, yeah, this is definitely true. Um, we love, frankly, we, we love it when supernatural and gothic elements overlap with dark academia books. We find those extremely fun. But we don't think that they are required elements. And I mean, certainly in a book like um, The Secret History, which is very much dark academia, the supernatural is not really a part of the story unless you, I mean, you could make an argument, I suppose. <laughs> but um, the gothic elements are certainly are certainly there. Family, yeah. or, you know, family secrets, regular secrets between people, the um, the just general aesthetic. There's a graveyard and like birds at one point, <laughs> like crows at one point. I think you could make an argument that that the book can veer into the gothic, or at least is pulling things from the gothic to create its particular aesthetic. I think in some ways, dark <clears throat> academia. Some dark academia can be the gothic happening in slow motion. And I think you Ooh. get this if you think about, I know, write this down, Brittany. I think this is good. But I know. I like this. <laughs> I think that thinking through the keyword opulence could be very helpful here because opulence is like, um, so the gothic is decayed opulence, basically. And I'm quoting loosely from Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints when I say this. So if the Gothic is decayed opulence, what we see in dark academia is often the process of opulence becoming decayed, right? Like often early on in a dark academia story, everything looks very shiny and abundant and opulent and luxurious. And over the course of the story, things seem to kind of fall apart. Um, so I think that there is a potential connection there. I love that. I think that's so interesting. That is such a cool way to think about it. And it just I, yeah, came to me. <laughs> I think that the 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 moles sort of that we talked about as being underneath the glitz and glamour of mm -hmm. higher education, of um, these fancy elite schools, these um, or institutions. I think that when you think about what think about that mold, I think you start to see the gothic sort of emerging. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's very cool. I texted you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm seeing um, people arguing about whether or not um, the Skull Laments books are dark academia <laughs> and the chat. And I'm like, welcome, welcome to our lives for the last <laughs> the last month. Um, I'm delighted that it. you guys are also grappling with it. Because I, I think that's a good one to do your own personal litmus test on because I think there are great arguments for including it and also perfectly valid ones for being like, nah. Yeah. Love it. But yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm really here for a dark ac dark academia as slow motion gothic. I think yeah. there's a lot there. Um, I think I feel like it's the gothic I feel like it's the gothic becoming. Like it's like yeah. the process of the breaking down. The N Gothicading. <laughs> the N Gothic Gothicading. <laughs> I love that. That's so great. Oh, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Like it. Stephanie says, wouldn't some Victorian novels have dashes of dark academia? I mean, not just the stories of James and Blackwood, but a lot of Dickens' more tormented characters are students. Yeah. I say that you could definitely think about some of those Victorian novels as proto-dark academia, perhaps. What do you think, Brittany? Oh, yeah, sure. I absolutely yeah. think so. And I, and I do, I mean, I think that, like, James and Blackwood, the... The vibes are right with them. The vibes are a little <laughs> bit different with Dickens to me, but mm -hmm. but I, I there's definitely an argument there for proto dark academia. Yeah, just that like you know something from Dickens, something Dickensian made its way into the dark academia cauldron. I can see that, especially something like um, 
great expectations in particular yeah. where we have this outsider coming into like, you know, money and glamour, but then there yeah. being like a rotten secret at the heart of it. Yeah, um, that's what I'm I think thinking there's too. There. There's yeah. there's definitely something there. I I I love I love thinking I feel like I feel like there should be like a paper about great expectations <laughs> and dark academia and and you know, I, I feel like it's sort of in the same kind of genre as like the picture of Dorian or the same kind of section of dark academia as the picture of Dorian Gray, because there's a lot of like Pep's education throughout mm -hmm. dark academia. Exactly. And throughout the throughout great expectations is dark academia in some ways, but also in some more of the like Lord Henry kind of way as well. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of discussion of. Uh, I don't know if it's intellectualism exactly, but it's life, I guess. And I feel yeah. like that's education that and life or something. But there's also a very like conscious discussion of like class in terms yeah. of like power differentials there. So I, I think that Dickens and Great Expectations in particular, we could think of as being part of the proto dark academia, part of the foundations that would eventually like combine to become dark academia as I like whip my hands around like this to demonstrate <laughs> we are combining them as you combining watch <laughs> yes. seeing the process in action <laughs> okay um Lisa says would you consider a discovery of witches to be in this genre um I think so I'll admit it's been a very long time since I've read it um, but from what I remember, I want to be like, yeah, yes. I want to say yes. Yeah. I, yes. I mean, I really, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to say yes, for sure. Because mm -hmm. I, I, the vibes are right there. <laughs> 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 I know I keep going back to that, but because it's funny, but I, I really do think that there is, there is something to that with regard to dark academia, at least for yeah. me. <laughs> Okay. Layla says, do you have any recs for DA stories set outside of the US or British Isles? I wish I had a big old list. In fact, I think probably as part of uh, putting together this course, we probably will try to create yeah, a list like of whatever you. length we can. Off the top of my head, I will say the ones that I think do it the most and it's not even completely because there's still like lots of us and british um parts to these books yeah. but babel um kwong's babel and novik's deadly education are both much more international in scope um most of babel does take place in oxford in england but parts of it take place in china um, the protagonist is half Chinese and it has, it's still in Britain, but it's from a very sort of like insider outsider um, perspective. Yeah. And the um, protagonist of a deadly education is half Indian, half Welsh and parts mm -hmm. of it take place in Wales, but most of it takes place like in a, dimensional pocket <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is nowhere um, and that is very, very international. So those are the two that I can think of immediately that are it, yeah, if they're, international, but I we need to find, we need to see if there are other ones already because I would love to know about them. Yeah, I would love to know about them too. If you have any recommendations, please put them in the chat. Yes, please let us know if you know of any. Okay, I'm like just kind of looking at the chat, which has run away in my absence, just to make yeah. sure I didn't miss anything super crucial. Okay. Um, Steve says, would you say that the adventures of Indiana Jones, professor of archaeology, is an example of dark academia? That is a fun question. I like that question a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think... I would say that it is, but I think I might say it's adjacent. But what do you think, Brittany? I don't know. Indiana Jones reminds me more of like adventure stories, like pulp mm -hmm. stories, um, even mystery stories. Um, mm -hmm. But but there's a 
there is a ever there's a little tinge of dark academia in there, which I yeah. I mean, I think I would be really excited if somebody was like, I'm going to make like a dark academia Deanna Jones story, which would be very fun. But I, I, I feel like they flirt with dark academia. I, I agree. I think saying it flirts with dark academia is perfect. And Mary just said in the chat that genre belongs in a museum. And I sighed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Really That's good. great. Excellent. Perfect. Well done. Yeah, so Steve. <laughs> adjacent at least we would say yeah. maybe not full-blown but like a relative a cousin yeah I think it just I think it's just it leans so hard on those old-timey kind of adventure stories that it that that sort of overtakes the dark academia elements of it but there's definitely a flirtation going on yeah okay Morgan say, says I've yet to read a dark academia book with a happy ending are there any well, I don't know how to answer this without doing millions of spoilers. Yeah, um, I know. Just do la, 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 la over your ears if you don't want to know for a minute. Um, I will say if you consider the Scholomance books that begin with a deadly education to be dark academia, I'd say that has at least a decently happy ending. Um, that's one I can reach for. Um, I feel like I can't say his dark materials because like it actually made me cry when yeah, I, read I was gonna say the last I was like, book as like a 14 year old. I feel like it's I don't know if it's it okay, so I don't think many of them have happy endings. I do think a lot of them have complicated endings. I where agree you, with that. Where you where you sit there and you're like, huh. You know, like not yeah. necessarily like there there are some that have like generally, genuinely sad endings but there are a lot that have endings that you're just like what do I do with this ending like, like that cause you to, to think there. about that yeah, yeah that cause you to that cause you to think in a way that is not necessarily happy or sad exactly but I think yeah, it's I think... hard to say that things are happy or because so so often dark academia involves characters that are really terrible and you kind of don't mm -hmm. like I mean like what would be a, I don't really want a happy ending exactly you know yeah, I was just thinking because so much dark academia stuff is about at least some of the people involved behaving, you know, horrifically, really, really badly. Like, it's not a genre that easily lends itself to like a super happy ending. Like, th these are not like Hallmark Christmas movie <laughs> type mm -hmm. type books, um, type stories for sure. Um, I'm really curious to see how the Ninth House trilogy i think it's still a trilogy and because yeah, okay. we we don't know yet i definitely want things to end happily for the protagonist but like a lot of people involved i'm just like well you're the worst so well, you're kind of the worst <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, um, the short version really is like i think they often this genre lends itself to complicated endings for sure Arlie says that the Starless Sea is only kind of DA, some of the same vibes for sure, though, but I thought it had a pretty non horrible ending. It definitely does. I have been struggling with this so much. I have, I'm like, is, dark, is the Starless Sea Dark Academia? Is it? Like, I, I ultimately think it is also just flirting with Dark Academia and is not actually Dark Academia entirely. Yeah, but, I think it's more fantasy <laughs> than Dark Academia. Yeah, but there's definitely some flirtation. There too. It, it, it flirts. It flirts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Maddie says, "Will there be a playlist for this course?" Um, there are two already. So. Yeah. They. So we made. We gave two uh, playlists out there. They are the Witch Fairy uh, Academia playlist, which is sort of like our take on Dark Academia. Um, twist on dark academia yeah I think they're amazing they're like my favorite playlist I've ever made and mm -hmm. I am just I'm really excited about it. especially the instrumental one I listen to like constantly mm -hmm. it's really good for working and but as far as a foundations dark of dark academia playlist I don't know maybe I'll think about it maybe can, yeah I mean I can come up with literally the thing is, like, I'd have to come up with something that was different enough from the dark, from the witch fairy academia ones, which yeah. might be difficult because a lot of those are like dark academia e songs too. So, 
I'll, I'll, I'll see if maybe I can do my take on it, perhaps. Um, but yeah, there are literally two already. If you haven't heard them already, um, or haven't found them, check your inbox. We emailed them to everyone a while back, everyone who was on our newsletter. You can also find it by going to our website and our blog on our website where we link to both of them there. And I think we did that last Tuesday. Yeah, so I got to say. Those two I, and I, maybe a third. We'll, we'll see. I actually have them right here. So <laughs> yeah. uh, here is the, um, that's the instrumental one. And then I have the one with actual songs. It's because I literally listen to these all the time. So they are, they were up in my tabs already. <laughs> I just flipped back over to the chat for a hot second and Jerry said, I think I see a bit of dark academia in uh, Harrow and the Locked Tomb series. And I totally agree. And Brittany was like, no. And I was like, but I but can see that a little bit. I actually think I see that more than the school events. books. <laughs> That's so weird to me. It's just because it has a vibe you like. <laughs> I do like the vibe. But it's not oh just my goodness. <laughs> I, I know it's not just, but yeah, I'm I'm with you, Jerry. Brittany is is not with us, but that's okay. We can we can be together on that. <laughs> All right. Um, Stephanie says, can the movie The Good Shepherd be considered dark academia? I have not actually seen that. Have you, Brittany? No, I haven't seen it. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Stephanie. I, we can't speak to that since neither of us are familiar with it. But it sounds intriguing. Story begins at Harvard and features the secrets in the CIA and MI6 throughout. I mean, it sounds probably sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sounds like it could be. Mm -hmm. SK says, what about Lee Bardugo's recent books, 9,000 Hellbent? Yeah. Yep, definitely. Thousand percent. Yep. The concentration is, is too high. <laughs> <laughs> the concentration is too high. It's also like so very clearly a critique of, Ivy League schools and I mm -hmm. and the power structures there. So I think it could even be a, like a subversion of dark academia in some ways. Yeah, which I think in some ways is a more useful way to think about the Scholomance books and deadly education as a subversion of dark mm -hmm. academia than straight dark academia. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably more accurate. A useful um, way to think about it. Yeah. But yeah, Bardugo's books are just, they're just dark academia. <laughs> Um, oh, this is an interesting question from Audra. She says, is GA anti-establishment of uh, dark academia, anti-establishment? Is it just interpersonal power conflict or students versus institution? I would say very frequently it's not anti-establishment, but sometimes authors go far enough where it is. And we think that this genre is most interesting, really, or frequently most interesting when it is. Um, yeah. Anything you want to add, Brittany? So I think, I think this is, this is, maybe, this is a little bit like um, maybe overcomplicating this, but interdiagetically within the world of the story, the, within the world of the novel, I think that dark academia is very much establishment. I think that the, um, that the people in the story get really caught up in institutions, in uh, universities, in um, in uh, often in following somebody with a lot of power and charge. I'm thinking particularly of the secret history here, where the the students are so enamored of this professor that they and this school and this this world that they're building together that it becomes it, it's it's very much about the establishment and about their obsession and. Uh, love affair with the establishment within the book. In extra diegetically, however, outside the story, when you're looking at the secret history, it's very clear that the the characters in the story, like there's something really wrong here. <laughs> and their obsession with um with classics, with this professor, with uh the way that things look um within the world of this intellectual world is very uh, unhealthy. And the book, you know, it, I mean, I don't think I'm giving much away when I say it doesn't exactly end happily. And it doesn't really end happily for any of the characters. And part of it is like this very deliberate shattering of this, um, 
this way of looking at the world that these characters really champion at the beginning of the story. And so I, I think that within the story, within these dark academia stories, there's often a lot of, of glorification of these, of these higher education things. But when you look at the story from the outside, you're like, oh, there's a little bit of critique going on here. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good point, Brittany. I think maybe sometimes even when it's not obvious, yeah. like within the story itself, like these stories, stories of dark academia are ultimately stories about systems that are somehow rotten, yeah. right? And like and it's that's, hard to avoid that. Yeah. And even if the story, the contents of the story doesn't necessarily dig too deep into that rottenness and why it's rotten, it's still there, you know? Yeah. yeah. It really, really is. And I think that that's, I don't know. It's it's hard though, because I do think that that's going on, but at the same time, they make these worlds very appealing. Like they yeah. make them very. Glitzy and glamorous. Yeah, yeah. It's seductive. And you, you're like, I want to be part of it, but there's mold and you see the mold and you're like, but I want to be part of it anyway. What does that say about yeah. me? What does that say about mm -hmm. this world? You know, it's it's really complex and fascinating once you get in and really yeah. into talking about it. And frankly, this is again why it took Brittany and I as long as it did to you know feel ready to do this course because obviously, like dark academia is not like mostly. I don't think sitting there trying to portray you know contemporary higher education like that's not really what this genre is doing it's doing some sort of like magical magical world story that is not a one-to-one -one correlation between mm -hmm. like you know magical yale and real yale or right. whatever or magical oxford and real oxford but because Brittany and i come from the land of higher education um you know we obviously loved it like profoundly loved it otherwise we wouldn't have been in it as long as we did and we certainly wouldn't have gotten phds but at the same time we saw a lot of how the sausage is made you know at at these schools we saw how wildly <laughs> underpaid um so many of the people who actually make this education possible are we saw things being hushed up that shouldn't have been hushed up i mean we've seen all sorts of things and even though again like you know we weren't part of you know, death cult secret societies or anything like that. It's at least as far as we're telling you. As far as we're telling you. <laughs> yeah. We're um it's hard to it is impossible to completely unpick in our head our heads dark academia versus our experience of actual academia. Like they're just mm -hmm. they are entwined. And I think the reality is like that's okay. That's just how it's okay. gonna be. And, you know, you can also, you can love something and also respect, you know, things that come out of it or parts of it and also be like, but this part over here, this part, not okay. Not you good. Know, not, <laughs> not good. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. We still have more questions. It's okay. We're, we're going to do it. Yeah. Okay, dokie. Amina says, I know there are a lot of European examples of dark academia vibes, but does the fandom slash subculture itself skew more American specifically than Western generally? There's something about like America as a young country yearning for a history we don't have via glorifying academic institutions that have been around for so long. Like it feels like an American fantasy for something we don't organically have. I don't know if that's an accurate read though. I think that's Ooh. very interesting. I love that read. I think that is really interesting. And I think that it's, a, it, you know, a lot of the European stuff that exists, a lot of this, the, you know, foundational stuff is European. But I do think that the subgenre, the sub uh, subculture that's developing around this, I, I think that that seems way more American. That seems... It, it does have that same sort of of the vibe of oh you know we we don't have that kind of stuff in the same way and so we're going to glorify these past um, these past institutions and things like that 
one of I think it also ties in really well with what Brittany was saying earlier about the bedrock of dark academia being watching aristocrats behave badly. Because mm-hmm. we like we don't have we don't have royalty. We yeah. don't have royalty, like technically, at least yeah. we don't have like a monarchy. We don't have um, an established aristocracy. But you know, dark academia could be one way of constructing it. Yeah. I have to say, I don't know as much personally off the top of my head um, for about the, the fandom and subculture to actually say how much it skews American versus other parts of the That's just my world. impression, for sure. But that's, yeah, that does not seem, that seems probable. But yeah, great observation. I like that. I like that a lot, too. Um, I was going to say something else. Hold on. I, oh, I'm sorry, Brittany. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not that. I just, I, I, I think I lost it, unfortunately. <laughs> um. Well, one of the things I was going to say was I, I wrote in a recent email about how I went to Sarah Lawrence. And one of the things that Sarah Lawrence did that they talked about constantly was how they had the same system as Oxford, where we had dons and we had um, instead of advisors and they were very, very attached to that idea. And I think that that really speaks to what you're saying here, this nostalgia for something that we never really had in America. I but then at the same that, time, they were like, we're so progressive. And right. Like, at the same time, weird, it's just the constant. Also, like, yeah. But also I, also we're doing think, <laughs> I also think that um, the American fantasy of it all, uh, Sarah was mentioning how we don't have aristocrats in the same way. And I think that that, that is you know, one of the reasons why we like sort of create these aristocrats is because we're dueling with this narrative of if you're rich in America, you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, you know? It's not like you're born into wealth like in England or something like that. And I think that kind of narrative is warring a little bit with some of the dark academia uh, stories that we have because, you know, these these people in these novels are generational, generational wealth often but it's so much easier to be like oh those bad aristocrats you know I I feel like there's a problem there that is there's there's a line to toe there that is hard in in American dark academia yeah that might be something that we continue to unpick in the course itself I'd like to think about it more yeah I'd like to think about it more that's great Amina thank you so much yeah okie dokie um, Michael says, in the same vein as Indiana Jones, are the Lovecraft mythos, dark academia, or adjacent? Often the characters are academics, and part of the loc- locales are universities, museums, and libraries. Great question. Um, I would say that that is uh, that Lovecraft is definitely like proto dark academia. Mm-hmm. I would say so too, especially since so much of what is written nowadays like in response to Lovecraft using Lovecraft sort of style is definitely dark academia feeling to me. I'm thinking in particular mm-hmm. of Sarah Monet's uh, The Bone Key Collection. I was too, yeah. <laughs> stories. Those feel very dark academia to me. They're set in the library and archive and or not a library, a museum archive. And um, it was somebody who, who picks through uh, lots of old uh, esoteric texts and things like that and she's definitely riffing on um lovecraft for sure mm-hmm. and and james and james and all of those those style of stories black uh blackwood i think that um because of that because of those for me that that aesthetic is definitely there i i would say that those stories are dark academia mm-hmm Yeah, I think some of them maybe read like as more like intensely dark academia to Mm -hmm. me as others, but at the very least. I couldn't say that like all of Lovecraft is or something. Yeah, but I think some of them are very dark academia. And at the very least, I would say it's foundational stuff in the dark academia cauldron. Yeah. I mean, like Bill says, uh, there's even a university. So (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Great question. Oh, really quickly before I forget, Amina, if you're still here because you're one of like five other people in the world who cares um, that I know, 
um, there's a new Hollick movie and I needed you to know that it exists so that you can also watch it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This is this is a manga and anime that Brittany and I are both completely obsessed with. Yes, Very I know. So Amina's Laurie. still here. She cares. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's pretty good. I enjoyed it. Not it's not dark academia, but it's, it's not dark folklore. academia. <laughs> it's not dark academia, but but I needed to tell Amina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Denise says, "Did you get Peter Straub's ghost story in there?" Sorry, I came in late and my feed kept cutting out. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry um, about that. I I didn't see that, but uh, and I don't know that story, but that sounds cool. <laughs> Yeah, we'll look for it. Yeah. Thanks for the recommendation. Okie dokie. Michael says, I've worked my entire career at a major inner city university in the heart of Detroit. Our student uh, base is mostly, um, I actually don't know how to say this abbreviation out loud if people like read out each of the letters, but BIPOC. And the university definitely doesn't fit an ivory tower aesthetic. Is their DA set in mostly non-white academic settings with a more diverse character base? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I don't think I've come across any yet. Um, Brittany and I are both like actively on the lookout at this yeah. point as part of just our, our project of familiarizing ourselves with dark academia. It's certainly not the convention. It's not the, um, it's not like the way that things usually are but oh my god we need more of it for sure we need more of it yeah i, I mean the school of man series is the closest thing i can think of same yeah so you know as part of our research for this course we're we're going to compile a list um and put you know whatever we can find on there again if any of you guys have recommendations um we would love to hear about it so if we find more we will tell you guys Okay. Um, says, I keep thinking about Matt Ruff's first novel, The Fool on the Hill, which although has fantasy elements and conflict and depth is still chipper, takes place at Cornell and has some elements but comes off as lighthearted. I wonder if there's a scale or a range from light dark academia to dark <laughs> dark academia like coffee color ranges. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that way of thinking about it. I like that way of thinking about it too. It's very possible. I know that light academia is definitely an aesthetic that gets shared on Instagram and TikTok. So, you know, as, as a counterpoint to dark academia, usually it's not associated with actual texts. It's much more about the vibe and the pictures <laughs> and the, the imagery. But I love thinking about light, dark academia books. And I think that they would probably love that too. <laughs> Mary says light roast in the chat. <laughs> light roast. Yes. Denise says um, the doctor and the devils is another, another one I haven't read, but it sounds cool. Thank you. And Moonbeam adds the name of the rose, which I have not read in so long. Oh my gosh, so I long. loved the name of the rose, though. Yeah, I, I need I, to reread that. It's been I, like yeah. over 20 years. <laughs> I think that, you know, she's like, is that dark academia? I, you know, it's definitely like in an institution of learning, as far as like a monastery is. But <laughs> I... I mean, it's about murder. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we got through everything in the Q&A. Oh, my goodness. We answered over 20 questions. Um, yeah, we'll wait for just a minute to see if any others come in. But thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you are still here and watching us right now, you are a champion. We've been talking for an hour and a half. Um, we hope that you will consider joining us for the course. It really is going to be spectacular. And I'm really excited about the movie nights. I think they're going to be really fun and chill. I'm um, super excited about the movie nights. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited. Like the first movie we're watching is Cruel Intentions, which is going to be ridiculous. I have not watched that since I was like a young teenager. And I'm fully expecting it to be terrible. Um, I watched it in preparation <laughs> for this. And I am very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to talk about this one. It's going to be hilarious. There's I know, so it's going to be so funny. 
Yeah, and like uh, like we said earlier, we're also going to talk about Wednesday in there as part mm-hmm. of movie nights. We're going to watch adaptations of the picture of Dorian Gray, the one from like 1945. So we're going real old school and an adaptation of Maurice. It's all going to be so much fun. If you have more questions um, about the course, just let us know. Shoot us an email. We're happy to talk about it. And one last thing, if you enjoyed this talk, something that would be insanely helpful to us if you feel like doing it is just sharing the link to it with somebody else who you think would love it. Um, just like getting the word out about Carter Hall, that we are here, that we do this kind of work, that we talk about folklore and literature in a fun, accessible way um, is so important and is honestly one of the trickiest things about running this business and keeping it going. So if you feel like sharing it, if you know anyone that you're like, oh, they would love this, um, just share a link to the, the free talk with them and we will be forever grateful. It would mean a lot to us. Forever grateful. Yes. Um, yeah. I noticed somebody in the chat says, I'm so sorry. I forgot that 7 PM Eastern time is not 7 PM for me. There will be a recording of, of mm-hmm. this talk available as soon as we finish. Um, it'll take a second for uh, Crowdcast to uh, prepare the recording, but it should be very quick right after we yeah. uh, close. And it'll be out. it'll be right here, like same link. This the talk will just like end here, and then you can press play and you can have access to it whenever. So no worries if you are just coming in now and you're like, no. Yes, there's um, a question totally in the okay. there's a question too. It says is the replay available? Absolutely, yeah. it'll be the here replay. whenever you'd like to watch it. Yes, and that's what we were asking people to share if they feel like it is the replay, which will be right here at the same link. If you can just share this link with anyone that you think would love it, um, it would mean the world to us. So thank you guys for being here with us. This was super, super fun. Thank you so much. Again, please do check out our new course, Dark Academia Foundations. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to be super nerds and it's going to be really great. So yeah, the link is right below where we're talking. It says join this course. Click right there to read all about it. Yep. And seriously, hit us up if you have any questions. Uh, we hope you see. You, we hope we see you there. It'll be so much fun. Um, otherwise, we will see you around with more, you know, free talks, free resources, more um, stuff from Carter Hall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be back soon. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.